in the abhay singh has moderate in the session dumind i can hear you yes. ah, okay yeah okay over to you dumind right uh, thank you monica so uh today we will be uh, this we will be discussing uh, uh, a post stroke rehabilitation uh, of an amputee a patient who was amputated some time ago and got a stroke so this will be done by dr takshila seniratna uh, our senior registrar in rehabilitation medicine and the discussion will be done by later by dr kulendrika kasturiratna so over to you takshila uh Good morning. Thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. Uh, today, in we have updated, as I said, we are going to talk. We are going to talk about about post-stroke rehabilitation of an amputee. Amputee. Akshila, Akshila, are you? You are joining in two devices. That's why they yeah. call. Yes. Yeah. Now we see it okay. Yes, clear. Okay. Yeah, now okay. Right. Sorry about that. So, um, shall we start, man? Okay. Slides. Okay, so uh, we'll be discussing about this post-stroke rehabilitation of an MPUT. Uh, so I'll first uh, start with a brief history of our patient. So he is Mr. F, a 69 years old married builder from Humpitia, who lives with his wife who is unemployed uh, in a rented house. And the only son uh, is married and he's um, working overseas. So uh, he has a back, uh, background history of hypertension and stable CKD. Uh, although uh, he was on treatment, he was very poor compliant uh, with his medications. In addition, there was a long history of left lower limb uh, edema, probably due to lymphedema, uh, which uh, resulted in several episodes of infection sepsis, ulceration, ultimately leading to necrosis and uh, left baloney amputation in October 2020. Although um, post-amputation rehabilitation was initiated, the process was intermittently interrupted due to the prevailing pandemic situation in the country. Uh, and uh, to make matters worse, he developed a left-sided coronary edita infarction in May 2021. So these factors uh, delayed the uh, rehabilitation process and he presented to RRH as a late admission in July 2021. So um, let's look at his examination findings. Uh, general examination, he was bed bound patient and he had a depressed look, but he was not pale or etheric. Uh, he had an average build. We, we could not identify any significant nutritional deficiencies. Uh, and he had this uh, left baloney amputation, which was edematous and um, uh, was unsuitable for prosthetic train, um, training at that time. And uh, coming on to the other systems, 
apart from the few basal uh, bibasal crepitations uh, we found in the lungs, there were no other significant findings in other system examinations. So uh, let's go to the uh, upper limb examination, which is important in our patient. So uh, when you look at the left side, he had the um, he had good power in all the levels, um, shoulder, elbow, as well as wrist and hand, uh, which was uh, great, which um, had a grade four power and all the passive range of movements were normal in those three levels. So uh, grip was average and sensory examination was also normal. In contrast, the right side power at the shoulder and elbow were zero and the shoulder movements were restricted. And there was pain and the query of subluxation as well. But at the elbow, it was all right. Uh, and uh, uh, at the wrist and hand, uh, the, uh, there was small muscle wasting and dynamic contractures. But there was, um, uh, interestingly, the uh, power was grade two, but the grip was poor. Again, sensory examination was normal. In his lower limb examination, uh, on the right side, which is the paritic side, hip power was one plus uh, with a um, one plus and uh, knee, ankle and toes, they were all having grade two power. And all the passive range of movements were normal at all levels. Coming on to the stump side, which is the left, uh, hip and knee had the power of grade three. And at hip, um, normal uh, room was there. But uh, at the knee, there was a flexion fixed contracture, fixed flexion contracture about 15 degrees. So now uh, we'll go to the speech and language therapist assessment uh, regarding speech and swallowing. So uh, he, uh, he had good comprehension uh, and uh, expression uh, was, no, uh, was oh, good, but the, there was a dysarthric speech. Uh, swallowing, he could take oral semisolids and he was given fluids through the NG tube. Uh, as the oral stage and pharyngeal stage was improving, but the pharyngeal stage was um, slow, uh, slowly improving, uh, we thought it's better to continue him uh, with NG fluids um, to both semisolids and fluids. Sorry, NG feeds to both semisolids and fluids. So he had good normal cognition with um, good orientation, registration, and all the other uh, components, he was good in uh, following commands. And the nutrition, um, he, uh, nutrition examination, he had a made up arm circumference of 25 centimeters and uh, he didn't fall under, um, under nutrition. And uh, the other parameters like blood sugars, proteins, hemoglobins, electrolytes, and uh, minerals, they were within normal limits at the time of examination, at the initial examination. So uh, now we will uh, look at the um, first multidisciplinary team assessment, where after examining the patient, we arrived at some functional, uh, patient's functional disabilities. Uh, we we um, uh, will look at those functional disabilities now. So he had um, dependent mobility and transferring, uh, no, like in mobility, no bed mobility, no sitting balance, and he had limited uh, range of movement at hip and knee, flex, knee levels with flexor contractures. And also the stump was edematous and with the flexion contracture. Transferring activities of daily living were dependent and he was um, on a 
indwelling urinary catheter with uh, bladder incontinence. And as uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, mild dysarthria was there, although the comprehension was good. And he was even uh, feeding via the NG tube. Uh, he had uh, no uh, significant problems in the skin. Uh, cognition and also good and uh, although um, we uh, could elicit some features of low mood and low motivation. Uh, the other um, parameters were the social and uh, medical com comorbidities which needed um, mention. So he, he had um, no caregiver from family to attend in hospital as his only son was residing overseas and uh, there were economic constraints to uh, um, find a paid caregiver. Uh, apart from that, the acute medical problems, as well as these hypertension, CKD, and post-injury depression, uh, we found that he, that, uh, he needs a system, um, attention. So now, after the initial assessment, then we, our uh, aim was to um, uh, put the patient um, uh, to assess the, the, his overall, uh, the, take the whole patient uh, holistically and uh, assess his function and disability. So for this, um, uh, usually what we use is this ICF classification introduced by WHO in 2001, uh, which is a biopsychosocial model uh, uh, used um, uh, to define and measure health and disability. So in this, as you can see, there are multidimensional concepts related to the body function and structure causing impairments. Then there are activity limitations and participation or involvement of people in all areas of life. So uh, apart from that, there are some other factors, what we call contextual factors. Um, those are in, can be environmental or personal factors, which can be either facilitatory or act as barriers to the, um, the function of this patient. Uh, although the personal factors are considered in this um, uh, model, um, uh, at ICF model framework per se, the, still it's not yet put to the ICF classification. So now let's see how, how we uh, use this framework. Uh, so this is uh, actually uh, an extension uh, given by the WHO for um, the amputees. This is uh, the same thing, but uh, they, are, they have given it separately and identified most relevant activities and um, impairments. Uh, let, we'll look at it later. So here is the, that um, table. Uh, so you can see they have identified certain uh, functions that are most relevant uh, to the uh, amputee. So uh, again, they have divided uh, the impairment activities and participation and contextual factors. So metabolism and endurance. Uh, I'll just uh, go through a few. And then activities uh, affected like mobility, toileting, dressing, and then the restriction uh, of um, recreational and leisure activities and remunerative employment and you know activities of daily living and so, so on and so forth. And then the common contextual factors, which are environmental and personal, uh, like um, technology and products for personal use, and then health professionals and how health services systems and policies uh, interact with this um, patient's disability. So next. So now we'll see uh, our patient. Uh, this is our patient's condition. Pathological diagnosis is left coronary radiator infarction with right baloney amputation. So we have put our patient's condition into this ICF framework. So here first is the body structure. 
posture and function impairment activity and then the participation restrictions he had so um, first uh, he's got general muscle, muscle wasting the sarcopenia then right sided increased muscle tone then he's got right hemiparesis and there is a left sided uh, below knee stump with flexion contractures and the dysphagia dysarthria loss of sphincter control and finally the low mood those are his impairments and because of that he has got some activity limitations so what are they he's got no bed mobility no sitting balance and he can't transfer from bed to chair and chair to bed and then there is restricted range of movement at the right shoulder joint and also he is totally dependent on uh, he's dependent on adl and uh, iadl and there's the, these functions also impaired. Uh, he's got slurred speech and uh, uh, swallowing is impaired. So he's on total NG feeding and there's bladder incontinence and lack of. We'll look at the participation restrictions he has. So he's non-ambulant, so unable to participate in family events or community events. And most importantly, he's incapable of doing a job and earn. So these are the environmental and personal factors uh, which contribute to his um, uh, disability. So uh, actually uh, he has uh, one barrier that is the travel restrictions encountered due to COVID-19. So it uh, interfered with caregiver presence and all, um, he did not have actual environmental or home barrier is to wheelchair mobility. So that is a plus point there. And coming to personal factors, there are some barriers. He's elderly and he has several comorbidities like hypertension, CKD, and then the, the, uh, he's using uh, many drugs. So drug interactions and adverse effects may, uh, may uh, interact uh, and affect this. And also the inadequate family support because his son is not in the country. So those are the personal factors. And uh, uh, so uh, now we look at, uh, we put the patient's uh, in, uh, impairments, functions, and uh, we found what the impairments, um, limitations and participation restrictions. And then now we have to assess uh, have an assessment like uh, quantify. So for that, there are some assessment tools which have been validated and used uh, in the all over the world. So this is actually specific for amputees. So there are, uh, again, they have divided uh, according to the impairments and activities and participation. They, they have separate um, uh, scales for to assess impairment, separate ones for disability and separate ones for participation. So I will uh, read out a few uh, which are important. One is um, uh, for impairments, uh, amputee mobility predictor and assessment tool. So like AMP Pro and AMP No Pro. Where AMP Pro is uh, those who have processes, we can use that tool for the ones who does, um, who. Uh, don't have, they, they can be, um, for them, the, we can use the SAMP no pro. So for disability, there are some general ones which are used in other conditions as well, and some specific ones. So the general ones are the Barthel index, we all know that, and use uh, very frequently. And there is this functional independence measure. We use it sometimes. Uh, for stroke as well, a uh, film. And uh, the other specific ones uh, like locomotor capability index are there. And for participation also, several um, validated tools are there. And one such tool uh, used in amputees uh, is the processes evaluation questionnaire. And um, in addition, there are disability scales um, next slide.
Takshila's connection is lost or something. Apart from that, these are the disability scales we selected, uh, which is the Medical Research Council scale for muscle power, MRS, that is the modified ranking scale, NIH. Uh, we can't hear. Can you all hear? No, can't hear. No, sir, not hear. I think Takshila has an unstable internet connection. Internet connection it probably. happened uh, in the morning also when she was doing a trial. Hello? Yes, can, can hear. Hello, can you Takshila? hear? Yes. Ah, yes, yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so these are the disability scales used um, for stroke uh, as well as this amputee, amputee patients. So uh, we chose these uh, out of the whole lot. We chose only the, we chose this. That is MRC, which is the Medical Research Council scale for muscle power. MRS, Medi uh, Modified Ranking Scale. NIHS, uh, we all know that, uh, used in stroke then the FIM and uh, familiar modified barter index. And in blue, you see uh, the um, ones we use uh, for amputees. Scale levels are used. Um, and uh, this other one is amputees mentioned. Next slide. Right, this is the same, actually the same thing, uh, again divided into the ones uh, used in the impairments and ones used in the activity limitation. So MRC, NIHS, and AMPRO, uh, they are used in uh, impairments and activity limitations, uh, MRS, FIM, Battle Index and the scale level and LCI for amputees. So let's look at uh, some of these um, quickly. So MRC uh, score is, uh, this is MRC score, which uh, look at the upper limb extremity and lower extremity functions. So each limb um, maximum total is um, 15. And so the, for the total marks for, for all four limbs will be, 60. In our patient, he is called 27. So that is uh, quite severe impairment. And uh, the modified ranking scale, it's a simpler one. And our patient fell uh, to this uh, MRS5, which is severe disability, which is bedridden, uh, incontinent, and requiring constant nursing care and attention. So this uh, NIHS actually uh, was um, done when he came initially. So that also uh, has a 17 out of 42. And you can see that uh, it is uh, moderate to severe in the, this above um, table. It falls between 16 and 20. So it's a moderate to severe stroke. So all the, um, uh, the 
uh, scales or, to, or tools we used showed that uh, the patient has a severe stroke. And this is the Bartel index on admission that also scored only 30 out of 100. So this is the K levels I talked about earlier. Uh, this is actually um, um, used uh, to uh, uh, prognosticate kind of uh, where the when um, we when we use the tool uh, we. Uh, forecast the ability or the potential for prosthetic ambulation. So there are uh, zero to four levels. And uh, uh, then this is mostly used in the insurance uh, for insurance purposes. Uh, so uh, when you say level zero, that patient uh, or the amputee will have uh, very minimal ability or potential to ambulate or transfer safely um, with or without assistance. Uh, so a prosthesis is not recommended. So likewise, mm, uh, this is another mobility predictor assessment tool, AMP No Pro, where uh, you don't need, need the, uh, the prosthesis. So this is, uh, you can, there are several, um, functions we look at, sitting balance, sitting reach, chair to chair. Uh, and we can see the first picture, it's a reaching. Uh, sorry, standing with support and uh, transferring. So, uh, and uh, this is another, uh, in uh, index, we use the locomotor capability index. It's actually a self uh, questionnaire. You can, uh, the patient can uh, fill it for himself. So now uh, from here on uh, the discussion, for the discussion, I will uh, invite uh, Dr. Lunendrika Kasturiratna uh, to take over from here. Right. Thank you, Takshila. Uh, good uh, good morning. Two minutes more. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Right. So uh, Takshila has done a very good job. Now she has taken a detailed uh, history assessment and everything. And uh, but I think you all will agree with me that this is a challenging patient. He has uh, left below knee amputation. And he has got the hemiparesis due to stroke in the sound side, that is right-sided weakness. So, uh, and he didn't have a, a proper rehabilitation because of various problems. So he is still having a uh, unhealthy stump, which needs a lot of shaping uh, for a prosthesis. And he is ha already having a contracture at the uh, proximal, uh, the joint proximal to the uh, stump because he has not had in, uh, proper instructions. And uh, so he has been bedridden after the stroke. It occurred in May, according to the last details. And he presented to uh, Ragama Hospital in uh, July. So bedriddenness has uh, resulted in uh, generalized muscle weakness. There is sarcopenia as well. And uh, so the hemiparesis has involved the dominant side, this dominant side, and it's also the sound side of the, uh, of the amputee. Right, so uh, what are we going to do? Can we do this uh, pre-prosthetic weight bearing? and uh, uh, whether we, we will not be able to teach crutch walking as uh, in other amputees. It's a part of the rehabilitation. And uh, he has, he's 69 years and he's having medical problems as well, hypertension, poorly control. So whether he will be able to uh, use the prosthesis with, with, this, with his uh, cardiovascular fitness. 
and we are unable to uh, do a fitness training here because of his disability. And he has already got a uh, cardiovascular event. The stroke resulted after becoming immobile following the amputation. And we have to maintain his mobility somehow or else he is going to get more cardiovascular complications. Um, and you can see this picture, his uh, stump is still edematous and looks like very lax uh, soft tissue and muscle. The second picture is showing a protrusion of the, of the bony edge of the uh, stump. So we have to do a lot before we uh, uh, think about the prosthesis for him. So to achieve all these obstacles, to uh, overcome all these obstacles, uh, the patient should be very cooperative. And uh, Takshila said that he has no mood and uh, there is lack of motivation as well. Right, so a lot of challenges. Uh, yes, so uh, this is uh, the condition of his upper limb. This is Takshila's video. You can see uh, the slight uh, finger movements are there, but they are mostly flexion. Uh, and uh, it looks like there is no hand function. Now this is uh, in August, three months after the onset of the stroke. And uh, whether we are going to, uh, I mean, what what should be our goals? We are. Uh, she has been having a. A fairly good uh, pre-morbid functioning. This is uh, after the amputation. Uh, he was uh, he was uh, independent with his wheelchair mobility indoors and uh, outdoors. Uh, he has had. Uh, Mobility, wheelchair mobility again, uh, and he has been dependent on a caregiver. And uh, he has managed to do his uh, independent ADLs in the sitting position, and communication was good. And he has had uh, satisfactory uh, social and uh, community interactions. He has been supervising his uh, welding workshop. Right? So, uh, what are the uh, long-term goals? So, and we to go back to his pre-morbid level. So, therefore, we can think about uh, uh, the mobility level should be independent wheelchair mobility and uh, independent uh, ADL in seated position. And he has been supervising the welding shop. So we have to go back to the same pre-morbid goals. I'm getting a message telling that this is not clear. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, maybe, maybe it's a regional <laughs> problem. Right. So uh, so will shall, are we going to go above that? So uh, are we going to stop at this wheelchair mobility level? But he has had this uh, immobility related cardiovascular event. So, and he has a lot of uh, family issues, social issues. So, if he's, I mean, we, we whether we can help him uh, more, like, uh, so uh, can we do a, a further rehabilitation to, to make him an independent person with uh, uh, prosthetically? Right, so his outdoor, outdoor mobility, whether he will be able to wait there with the prosthesis or whether it's going to be a wheelchair mobility again. And uh, can we make him independent in his all activities of daily living rather than the uh, sitting uh, in a wheelchair? Right, so and uh, for the his uh, welding workshop and the social and community activities, 
uh, whether he will be able to uh, use a prosthetic limb instead of the wheelchair mobility and uh, and he needs uh, to maintain cardiovascular health so we, will we be able to introduce the exercise program for his uh, future uh, healthy uh, life right so uh, having all these uh, challenges takshila and her team has uh, made some goals the uh, takshila can you describe your initial goals takshila yes madam thank you so these were the initial um, yeah i can hear you madam hello hello Yeah, you are going to talk now. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Can't you see this screen? Hello. Can't Can you see, see this screen? Hello. See. Yes, Takshila. Ah, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, now can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ah, okay, okay, then right, right. So, uh, I'm sorry about this. So, um, now uh, this is the first uh, interdisciplinary team meeting in July, uh, and uh, in that we had some, some smart goals. So, physiotherapy-wise, it uh, we wanted to make the patient independent in med bed mobility and static sitting balance in one month duration. Then. Uh, Occupational therapy, functional sitting balance uh, in two months and voluntary hand three months time. So speech, we aim for a normal speech in one month and a total oral feeding in one month. A nursing, actually, there were um, uh, no major problems. Uh, so keep the normal bowel movements and uh, therapeutic positioning and repositioning to prevent pressure ulcers. And uh, the, the one problem he had was that uh, he was incontinent uh, with um, bladder. So we continue uh, within one month's time. Yeah, so um, then the prosthetic and orthotic. So at the moment, um, there is no um, prosthetic um, in the making. So uh, what we hope was uh, that we could have a temporary prosthesis uh, to bridge uh, within about two months time. But that was, uh, uh, we are only at the beginning of planning that. And nutrition-wise, hydration to keep the hydration and uh, give a, very, a balanced semi-solid diet via the NG. So, so that was the plan for nutrition and the medical uh, normal and uh, stable blood pressure uh, monitor um, to keep the um, patient on uh, uh, stable blood pressure. Uh, and achieve that within the next two weeks and the psychosocial support. So to relieve uh, the depressive symptom, uh, education and counseling. So those were the first meeting um, goals, uh, goals. So you can see uh, that the, he has improved uh, within this period. And uh, in the first picture, yeah, he's sitting with support. Uh, and then um, the second one, static sitting balance is there. And uh, you can see the, uh, that we have uh, the stump bandage, but still the, there's a little bit of contracture with the, uh, at the knee. So ideally uh, what you should have was this stump board for the wheelchair fracture from formation. So other things they are, uh, he should, apart from the stroke um, rehabilitation, uh, these uh, stretching and strengthening exercises uh, should be done to the stump side, which will help in the rehabilitation process. So 
So again, this is that uh, the picture you can see again, this uh, stump shape is not that good. And although he can um, lift the leg, uh, there is, uh, it's not uh, complete. And also that the contracture, knee flexion contracture is still there. And now he's motivated than before. And he's doing this by manual tasks and uh, he's interested in further rehabilitation now. So uh, then uh, in August, uh, we did the first review of goals, that is after one month. So uh, by that time he had gained independent bed mobility and static sitting balance. So that uh, we have the happy face. So that is, uh, we are, um, we have achieved that. So we are happy now. And what about the second one? Uh, we are not very happy. So that is because we, the functional sitting balance, voluntary hand movements uh, have not come as expected. So again, we have some uh, given some time uh, for functional sitting balance, two months and hand movements, three months. So we hope to gain more progress during this period. And speech, he's achieved a normal speech in one month and uh, oral feeding, total oral feeding in one month's time. And that is a major achievement and so very happy. And nursing also, uh, he's having normal bowel movement and uh, no pressure ulcers at the moment. And the trial without catheter succeeded and he's got better continence now. So very, very happy. And uh, prosthetic and orthotics, and like I mentioned, it's only uh, an idea still. We have not gone ahead with making the processes. Uh, and nutrition wise, uh, he's good. And uh, now we have gone beyond the, um, achieve, uh, beyond the expected goal and achieved normal feeds orally instead of just, so what we planned, uh, that is semi-solid balanced diet. So uh, we have, uh, three happy faces, uh, uh, two more happy faces, that is medically and psychosocially also, he's, uh, he has uh, gained improvement. So next, uh, Madam will discuss the rest uh, of the uh, uh, this, uh, presentation. Over to you, Madam. All right, thank you. So we have some improvements. So after this uh, goal, review of goals, most of your goals have been uh, achieved in one month's time. Now you have to set new goals and proceed. So just to remind you the uh, initial uh, plan and our challenges. Uh, so to achieve uh, the further these long-term goals, we had to set new short-term goals to reach this level. So, uh, and what are the positive gains we have already? So he's motivated now. Sitting balance, having sitting balance, even static sitting balance is a very uh, positive and uh, positive prognostic sign. And he has got normal swallowing. Communication is good. And uh, he is continent now. And most of all, he has good cognition. So uh, these are many positive gains. So we can uh, think about further goals and see whether we can achieve, uh, make our uh, that initial long-term goals uh, realistic. And uh, I think uh, Takshila is now going to describe the new short term goals. Uh, I, shall, I have to uh, thank uh, the physiotherapist. I don't know your name. Hope you are joined here. Uh, I got these uh, your goals and things uh, to complete this uh, slide. So Takshila, can you describe the new short term goals now? Yes, madam. Yes. So uh, once again, thank you for sending this. And uh, so what the, uh, our new goals are to um, have 
uh, to enable right shoulder flexion by 30 degrees in six sessions and to get upper limb muscle power to three, that is also in six sessions and enable lying to sitting with 75% patient contribution within the next three weeks period. Uh, and there are some other goals we have set that uh, those are, um, these are uh, free sitting for 10 seconds uh, in three sessions, sh shaping the stump by bandaging within the next two months uh, and improve the hip and knee muscle power of left lower limb from uh, left lower limbs and uh, uh, right from zero to three and left from three to four. That is also in six sessions. So the other uh, issue is the cardiovascular conditioning. So that we have to think about uh, assessing the patient's uh, general condition and the other um, comorbidities at the time and have a plan because uh, it is very important why uh, uh, in um, amputation, um, in amputees, uh, usually there is uh, more increased energy expenditure during ambulation. And uh, in this um, uh, bar chart, you can see that different levels of lower limb amputation, the percentage increase in energy expenditure. So our patient, uh, he has got transtibial amputation. So that's the second one from uh, one. And you can see it almost 40% um, necessary uh, for such patients. So uh, as the patient is elderly and uh, other, with the other comorbidities, we have to uh, be cautious in setting uh, up a cardiovascular um, rehabilitation plan. Uh, so that was the physiotherapy uh, goals, and these are the occupational therapist uh, goals, uh, to have functional sitting balance in two weeks' time, independent uh, PD uh, grooming with sound hand, two weeks, uh, because we, we uh, thought it's uh, better to go on with the sound hand uh, because the other side uh, still the movements are, uh, you know, pro the, uh, the improvement is very slow. So we wanted to make him uh, independent quickly. So that's why we opted to his hand. Uh, and so bimanual activities, encourage bimanual activities uh, and improve them within the next four weeks period. And nursing just maintain the normal uh, bowel functions and help feeding with the balanced diet, diet and uh, the psychological support. So we have put the duration for two months and the prosthetic and orthotic. So that is uh, the one we are thinking about now, whether to have a bridging with the temporary prosthesis and uh, how the prosthetic training should be carried out within the next two months. So, Madam, uh, yes, Takshila, thank you very you, much. Yes, so there you have a uh, new short term goals in the process of uh, doing the continuing the rehabilitation therapy. Uh, so, and also these goals were also in your list uh, long term mobility goals, whether we can uh, achieve standing balance with the device support. So, because of this. Um, uh, amputation to start weight bearing, uh, we need a temporary prosthesis or a, a temporary mobility aid. And there are other options as well, this uh, forearm support frame or a tilt bed. But again, we need a, a support for the uh, left leg, which have the below knee amputation. And uh, to achieve sit to, sit to standing also with the device support. So we don't know about the duration. So we can't set a smart goal for this uh, at the moment. And this crutch walking is going to be uh, uh, unrealistic uh, goal here in this patient because we don't know whether his uh, hand functions are going to uh, recover fully. And about the prosthetic training also, we are not sure 
at the moment. And at this level, uh, Tapsila and myself had a discussion with Dr. Niroda uh, as well, uh, because we have very less experience in uh, this type of uh, challenging patient, and we don't know the correct way to go ahead. Uh, so she also recommended the same. A temporary prosthesis, forearm support frame, and the tilt bed actually was suggested by Dr. Niroda Gunavandana. Yeah, so these are uh, early walking devices which can be used temporarily for an amputee uh, at the pre prosthetic rehabilitation level. But you know, our patient is having a right leg weakness. So the initial two pictures are the ordinary temporary prosthetic uh, uh, equipments to start this uh, uh, mobilization. The third picture is the uh, pneumatic mobility aid. It's, a, uh, it's not new actually, has been uh, in practice from the year 1971. Uh, here, uh, I have shown this uh, forearm support walk walking frame and the tilt bed, uh, which can be used to uh, get the experience of weight bearing. Now, weight bearing is essential in this patient for the part of stroke rehabilitation. And uh, even if the upper, upper limb function is late, so it's, it's, if it is, even if it is not going to uh, improve to a functioning hand, the tone of the lower limb, the affected uh, limb, that is right leg, may uh, improve. Therefore, we can have these things in our plan. Uh, so this uh, pneumatic uh, post-amputation mobility aid, this picture was actually downloaded by Taksla and she sent it to me. And uh, you can see there are several airbags. Uh, this is the one, uh, the, the, the first uh, short and small one is the first one to wear. So uh, these... Uh, yeah, these bags will be inflated using this uh, pump and there are standard recommended pressure gradients. So finally, this uh, rigid metal uh, frame will be uh, applied. So there are a lot of advantages here. Yeah. It's a temporary uh, device. Designed for partial weight bearing only. It's a temporary thing, post amputation. It, uh, the, it can be used uh, as early as post op day seven if the wound is well healing. And uh, the weight bearing is done over air cushions uh, and uh, will help to reduce the residual limb edema and will prepare the patient for a harder socket in the prosthetic uh, limb. Uh, this can be placed over the uh, some bandage, soft dressing, bandaging, or even plaster cast or, or over the trouser. So that is also a, a, a positive thing. And it will be a, a, a very important psychological benefit for the patient during this early stage of uh, Right. So, uh, so having this uh, hope if the physiotherapy team is going to improve him to at this uh, that uh, better mobility level, the occupational therapist is also going to plan her uh, ADL training, self-care, feeding, dressing, washing, toileting. So we don't know uh, whether the patient is going to do them independently or whether he is going to be seated in the wheelchair and do them. So we don't know the duration at the moment. Uh, hopefully, the physio team will get him to stand. And uh, if he improves up to that level, he will need to learn stump care and prosthetic care as well. And finally, the social and financial support is also in the uh, rehabilitation program with the help of the social service officer. He will need the vocational support because now he is not going to have his uh, income. Uh, maybe we can support him to continue his welding workshop. Uh, he has been supervising it uh, during the past months, uh, even after the amputation. Right. So 
all depends on the stroke recovery and the biggest problem now here is the recovery of his hand uh, so the evidence we know is that there is some motor recovery in most of all the patients most of the patients uh, for stroke but uh, this most rapid improvement or recovery is happening during the first 3 months after the stroke and we couldn't we didn't have him during that uh, important uh, window period uh, uh, up to 6 months uh, it can continue with the plateauing effect after the first 3 months but uh, uh, the the evidence says that uh, the advanced rehabilitation techniques may help improve the hand function even after 6 months but that improvement is going to be lower than the initial first 3 months i think you are familiar with this word i have repeatedly telling these words in my stroke lectures repetitive task specific movements cimt or the contrast induced um, uh, motor treatment uh, bilateral symmetrical exercises motor imagery techniques including the uh, mirror box treatment uh, and neuromuscular electrical stimulation or the uh, functional electrical stimulation so those uh, techniques are proven to be uh, very effective in the the rehabilitation of uh, post stroke hand but all those techniques need some degree of residual movements so we can't we still can't do anything for the severely affected hand uh, even uh, we can't use those any of those techniques that is the problem here and uh, again there are few things which can uh, predict the prognosis uh, the severity of the upper extremity weakness at the onset and timing of the return of movement that is an important predictor of the eventual motor recovery and uh, if the uh, upper limb paralysis uh, upper limb was completely paralyzed at the onset and by four weeks if there is no uh, significant uh, strength distal uh, strain that that hand is not going to uh, return to normal function and uh, we want the early finger extension not the flexion as a good sign of future hand recovery so uh, looks like this patient is not uh, going to get the prop, uh, full hand recovery uh, i think that's why the occupational therapist she must have sensed this and she has decided to adl training using the left hand but we have to continue uh, uh, the possible activities like by manual activities uh, for the right hand as well uh, in hope of uh, any possible improvement right so uh, 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 about this uh, forearm support frame uh, he doesn't have a uh, satisfactory grip uh, of his uh, right hand right distal hand so initially he will still be able to wait bear but needs supervision or uh, um, two people or one person uh, as a contact guard uh, still we can use this use the temporary prosthesis if they are going to get it i think takshila said that he was about to be sent to the um, piano workshop to uh, assess for the temporary uh, prosthetic uh, equipment and uh, if if he is not going to uh, get the right hand function uh, this one arm drive one arm drive for arm support is an option for a non functioning now usually we uh, recommend the assistive device this uh, arm support uh, for the arm which is in the uh, good side of the i mean when you compare the limbs if he had the amputation in the left uh, leg we need the we will advise him to use the uh, support for the right hand but here he doesn't have the right hand power so uh, no we found that it's not a hard and fast rule that uh, always uh, the good leg 
the, the side of the good leg should be given the walking uh, support uh, we have to train him to using his uh, remaining good hand that is the left hand and uh, yes so any to discuss any questions so you can ask takshila any comments hi hello yes yes ah yeah. uh, duminder yeah i think the biggest problem this patient had was he never had a post prosthetic or post amputee rehabilitation so if he had that we wouldn't face any of those problems like coming i see 50% of our problems would have been settled uh, unfortunately he was not referred so and even after the stroke he came late probably due to the the circumstances in the, the environment and this uh, the covid issues uh hello do you hear me yes yes we are we are yeah. listening and when we were doing the ward rounds the problem was like the physiotherapist were uh, like they were asking whether the pnos could make a, a prosthesis for him then they can make him stand and that improves the weak limb but the 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 p the problem with the pnos was that they were not able to make a a, a prosthesis uh, the, the available with available things because they needed crutch walking before that so that is why as you said these pneumatic devices are helpful because the proper prosthesis they cannot make because he is not able to stand because they are the the, the good side the sound leg was paralyzed yeah they just coming okay thank you yeah duminda may udaya udaya said that uh, they have this uh, forearm support frames all right so if, yeah if yes. uh, if a temporary prosthesis or whatever is available they can uh, start the weight bearing yes. with the that, yes. that uh, forearm support yeah that is what we were planning now actually his circumstances have changed so like we sort of wanted to we wanted pno to pno to review re him again for a temporary prosthesis and the condition of the staff is also <laughs> yeah yes right uh, yeah this is dumit dharmani das yes uh, i think the main issue is that uh, now yeah everything has become late with the not having the prosthesis so now taking overall uh, we i don't think we have i don't know whether the pno make anything call uh, temporary prosthesis but these temporary prosthesis are pre made ones like the pneumatic one we had one in our department earlier but i think it's not functioning now with the motor is not working or something so earlier we used to and even in normal uh, P, uh, the uh, the amputees we used to put that and start the walk in training early which is was very helpful when they have the real prosthesis because that improves the rehab part becomes very much easier if you have this so probably something which you are look for is to see whether we can get some of these pneumatic devices into our uh, places where we do the prosthetic uh, provide the prosthesis because the prosthetic training and you no know, pre prosthetic training will become much easier if you have this even in a otherwise normal person now, this person definitely need something but the other issue is even with that uh, because of the loss of one hand generally even this that people will need bilateral the patches uh, or uh, actually patches for mobilize before uh, until they train so that's a issue so probably forearm supported for him may be one option again the balance is going to be a issue still because we have a stroke so this is a very difficult patient probably what i feel is overall the goal should be which are mobility on long term everything uh, could end yes looks like but i think takshila was i mean it's a good learning for her so she uh, searched other options as well and discussed with the therapist and uh, included those slides in the lecture so we will see That's at least which mobility, mobility should be offered to them. Hmm. Yeah, I think that will be the reality goal. But then I think yes. working on other things is good thing that we. I mean, sometimes these things surprisingly works. Yeah. So I'm not 
could not be but i did yeah, yeah the one point i think we had to learn is try to get the this uh, the temporary one takshila is the our pno say whether they can do something called temporary they can they make separate uh, or... they said they can uh, they can uh, they said they will just first see the patient uh, how the stump is and then uh, we will uh, try to do something um, i don't know uh, but we couldn't go ahead with that uh, before they um, they couldn't still see the patient sir. okay right yeah we have to Yeah, the thing is now that we see look at the cost and now I mean, what are they going to do as a temporary one with the um, they're going to use a or the opponents that could be used in the normal cost cases. Then uh, the cost and probably we can use it later. Do a later is okay. Otherwise, we have issue. Then the what? Yes. Temporary ones are the pre-made ones. If this is not it, then other ones. क्वेश्चन Right. So we thank uh, Dr. Akshila Senviratna uh, for doing an excellent presentation, and uh, Dr. Gunendra uh, Kasuratna for helping with the discussion and all that. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akshila Senviratna and Dr. Gunendra Kasuratna for excellent uh, discussion, very fruitful discussion, and uh, thank you, Dr. Gunendra Vesik for uh, moderating. Thank you all for participation. So we will meet it next. Third. Can I just put a word, madam? Uh, I want to thank uh, Budendika, madam. Uh, she helped me a lot, and thank you, madam, uh, for helping me to do the presentation and all this. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye, bye.